vengeance. Newsflash. Batman fans enjoy Batman film. Greetings, fellow nerds. I'm Chris. I'm Michelle. And we are D's Nerds, and we are talking the Batman. Okay. <laughs> if you're familiar with this channel at all, you know that we have been very excited for the Batman. And we finally got to see it last night after COVID delays and all other sorts of shenanigans that have happened here in the last year or so. And we got to see it at for the IMAX pre-screening up in Branson, Missouri. Just great event. You know, the the nerd informants were there. You know, Tim and Josh are always so nice to us. And it was just a great, great, great night to be a uh, Batman fan, a comic book film fan. And uh, it was it was just a blast. Yeah, it was a lot of fun. It was really exciting to get to go. Um, we were surprised that we got seats. So <laughs> it was exciting. Yeah, it was one of those things where we literally saw, like, I saw an article, like, the day before that said all IMAX pre-screening uh, tickets have sold out. And so I was like, okay, well, there's that. And then Michelle looked online and found a couple of seats there. And there were actually some open seats there in the theater. Yeah, I don't think they ever sold out of that one. So yeah. But but it was just a great night. It's always great to see an IMAX film. I think that was the first IMAX film we'd seen since Aquaman. And that's kind of sad. Uh, we need to, you know, hopefully with everything going back to normal, we can actually go out and see more movies in theaters so but anyway on to the batman um of course this will be a spoiler review because by the time we're dropping this it'll be thursday uh but you know if you are still if you still haven't seen the movie by this point i will go ahead and just say it's really good you should go watch it kind of a thing <laughs> so but okay so at this point we're going to start talking uh more spoilers and everything there so y'all yeah i'm a batman fan full background and probably you know i've ranked the live action batman movies before we'll put a card up there for that so you can see there but no big shock uh, basically the dark knight trilogy and batman 1989 i love them i believe you uh you're in a similar kind of spot but you actually love the dark knight rises as one of your absolute favorites yes yeah dark knight dark knight rises is one of my absolute favorites really the whole dark knight trilogy i really love um so i had high hopes going into this one, but it, I knew it was going to be hard to stack up against it. Yeah. And so, and, and I've said on other videos before, I thought that it had the potential to be one of those movies that we, that I discuss alongside Batman 1989 and the dark Knight as being some of the best Batman movies ever. Full disclosure. I don't know how I feel about it just yet. As far as like where I would rank it. I'm pretty sure I know how I feel. Yeah. <laughs> but we'll we'll but we'll get to that as we kind of roll throughout this. So let's just kind of start breaking it down. So I thought we kind of go with the influences first, the comic influences. Obviously, there's you know a lot of noir driven stuff. You know something in the vein of like Seven and other movies of that nature, David Fincher movies that definitely it gleans a lot from. But as far as comic influences, some of the you know, typical things you would see, which definitely have their fingerprints on this one. Year One is definitely one there uh especially with batman not being in year one but more year two it's definitely alongside that um the long halloween also has a lot of fingerprints all over it i'm specifically looking at more of the batman trying to solve a mystery not really knowing what's going on and their frequent crimes that are occurring leading to kind of the piece you know the 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 cheese at the end of the maze so to speak definitely that's going on there and uh I, Ego is another one. That's a fairly... That's one I hadn't read until the last few months. And I can see some of that too because in this... Batman is interested in just being Batman practically. Bruce Wayne is Batman and Bruce Wayne doesn't want to be Bruce Wayne at all. Yeah, right. I think that's accurate. Yeah, and so, I mean, there's even one point at the beginning of the film where Alfred's like... The accounts are coming over and he's like, why? And he's like, well, you know, he's like, he's like I don't care about any of that. I don't... He literally does not care about anything going on with Bruce Wayne... Uh, Wayne Enterprise, nothing cares, nothing for it, and uh, but so I can definitely see that kind of idea of Batman and Bruce almost being two different things, which Ego deals with very well, I think. But I think the biggest one and the one I wasn't expecting to see as much as I did was Earth One. There are specific things in there that are lifted directly from Earth One. Uh, Alfred's portrayal in this. Uh, you know, being more of like a bodyguard for the Waynes, that's definitely something that comes from Earth One. Um, 
Yeah, and Michelle, this is something you can speak to a little bit more, but a lot of uh, the gadgets and things being a little bit more handmade, that's stuff that came directly from the beginning of Earth One. I know that's one thing that you loved about this film. Yeah, sometimes I get um, a little, little bit tired with comic book movies. Everything is always so futuristic and always so like perfectly geared to whatever hero and um, some of the things just seem a little outlandish or just impossible and I really liked that all the tech in this felt like something that someone who had time to tinker could definitely sit down and figure out how to make. Yeah exactly I like and I love that and you said this last night after the movie everything on his suit has a function even the yeah. bat symbol which is like a blade that he uses to cut which is Something, there was talk that maybe that would be like made from the gun uh, that killed the Waynes. That's been something that's come out in comics before, but uh, I don't know necessarily, they didn't go in depth on where it came from. But, you know, it, the fact that it was a blade was just really well thought out, mm -hmm. I thought. Uh, but, that, I mean, that was definitely one thing with the tech kind of being more homemade. Bruce being very much a gearhead. Um, you know, that Batmobile looks, it, it's not like something military grade. It's definitely something that a car geek made in his spare time and that's definitely uh the feeling that we get there uh, there's also other stuff like especially the in the movie thomas wayne was running for mayor when he and martha were killed and in this we find out that uh that martha was part of the arkham family so the arkhams and the waynes kind of you know with thomas and martha kind of became one family and so in that uh they, un, a reporter uncovers the truth that Martha's mother killed her father and then killed herself, and she suffered from mental illness. And Martha also suffered from mental illness and was in and out of institutions. Reporter finds that out. Thomas wants to keep it under wraps uh, by paying him off doing something. They don't want to do that. And uh, he turns, rather stupidly, I think, to Carmine Falcone, who ends up taking him out. And that becomes the big reveal that we see the Riddler having regarding uh, Thomas Wayne and kind of the breadcrumbs that lead up to the Riddler's big plan. So, But the idea of the Arkhams and the Waynes and Thomas uh, and Martha and Martha's backstory with her mother and father, that was all lifted directly from Earth One. And I thought it was actually really well done the way they placed it in there. Um, and I also, and so actually I think Earth One has the most DNA on this film of any of them, uh, actually, which is cool. I like that because I really like Earth One's storyline. So there's a little, little comic geek moment kind of taken out there. If you're wanting to look into what comics to kind of read that went into kind of a lot of the, the ideas behind the Batman, those are the, the, the four that I would definitely recommend. Uh, so let's... Let's move on to actor performances and kind of the portrayals there. Um, Got to start with Batman. Robert freaking Pattinson. First of all, if there's anybody on this that's watching this video or anything that talks about Sparkle Batman, Twilight, or anything else, just get out. Like, no one cares anymore. He is phenomenal as Batman. And you know, that was actually one that we we're thinking like this was we had a discussion about two months before he was cast that we thought he would make a great dark horse candidate for batman mm -hmm. yeah he's um i think he has a bad rap because of twilight even though i don't actually think that was his fault um i think that he was a victim of writing and directing in that but um he does such a good job in this and like any any edward cullen is is disappeared out of you know his his acting at this point um none of that is apparent he just does a brilliant job um communicating like how kind of broken Bruce is mm -hmm. and how um I would say taciturn is a good word like he's a he's very much a Batman a few words he doesn't he doesn't say a lot he spends a lot of time with his mouth shut observing yeah that's definitely I mean you see that in the funeral scene for for the mayor towards the beginning of the film when the I forget her name but the uh, the other candidate was talking trying to talk to Bruce and try you know like you're not doing any philanthropy work your family was known for doing this stuff and Bruce says hardly anything to her he's just kind of like can can you please not be talking to me right now like he hates not having the cowl on or doing batman things he hates doing bruce stuff and yeah i mean but it, he does such a good job very reminiscent to me of michael keaton in that he's a lot more silent than other iterations have been 
And, but the thing that I will say that Michael Keaton has missed is really knowing what's going on in his head. And the way they did the narration was just spot on good. Yeah, they do some um, voiceover narration for him. So he's actually able to kind of narrate over some events that are happening via him kind of reading his own journal, essentially. Yeah. Um, one of his pieces of tech, which is probably the only piece of tech I would say is kind of like questionable whether it could be a functional thing or not. Um, were these contacts that he wore everywhere he went when he was in his Batman outfit to um, record everything that he saw so that then he would go back to um, the Batcave and sit and watch the things that he had that he had seen over again and he would take notes and like write in his journal about everything that had happened. Mm. And so kind of what we get in that narration and that voiceover is, is some of what he's writing, how he's kind of processing everything that happens. Yeah. And yeah, he's absolutely phenomenal. I mean, he very well may be one of the best Batman I've ever seen. Like I said, I'm still trying to process and everything. I definitely want to watch this again. But, you know, moving on, I mean, Zoe Kravitz, uh, Selena Kyle, and Catwoman. I've always said that Selena Kyle should be street smart. She should be able to hand her, handle her own. She doesn't need anybody to come save her. And, of course, sexy as all get out. And that is Zoe Kravitz's performance in this. Uh, she is absolutely stunning in this role. I do feel like she wields her sexuality less as a weapon than maybe some of the other cat women yeah, I've seen. That makes sense. Like she is sexy, but she's not like using that for manipulation for the most part. Yeah. Like it's just who she is. That's just naturally yeah, part of who she yeah. is. That's just her character. Yeah. So I thought that was cool. Um, I also liked her costume. I thought it looked really cool. And I liked that it wasn't quite so like on the nose cat woman. It made sense for somebody who from the streets, what they would make up. Yeah, because I mean, like her her headpiece is essentially like a like a ski mask with just like the nose piece and then like the top of the head, so you can see like all of this. Yeah, and like the mouth. the ski mask just happens to lay where like it comes out like yeah. two points right here, like kind of like cat ears. Yeah. So I mean it, but I also thought that you know her chemistry with Robert Pattinson was spot on. It was one of the best depictions of that relationship I've seen on screen. Yeah, it was really good. Um, it felt natural. It didn't feel like it Very. was forced. Yeah. And I think that, I mean, I know, like, I think in the past, maybe they dated at some point. I think I'd read that somewhere or something. Maybe, I don't know. Like, maybe that was a rumor. But it, you could definitely feel a natural chemistry going on there, whether they're just great actors or whatever. But um, next, I got to go to Jeffrey Wright as Gordon. I mean, when you've had someone like Gary Oldman, I mean, to me, before this movie, Gary Oldman was just absolutely iconic, bow down, amazing as Gordon. But after this, man, Jeffrey Wright does phenomenal in this. And he's, I mean, his chemistry with, with Batman is great as well. And he brings a little something different to it, I think. Yeah. Um, it's like a different personality type than, than our Gary Oldman Gordon. Um, he's a little bit... I don't know. It feels like he's more openly willing to like kind of buck the rules and take a risk mm -hmm. at, you know, at, at this point, um, which would be earlier in his career than what we saw a lot of Gary Oldman as, yeah. um, in the dark Knight trilogy. So I think it was cool. Yeah. And I think actually between Gordon and Batman, you had probably some of your funnier moment. There's not a whole lot of humor in this, no, even compared not. to the dark Knight trilogy, which people will talk about being dark and gritty that had more humor than this has. But the funnier moments in this actually are between Gordon and Batman, I think, on a couple, like, the thumb drive. Yes. <laughs> which... And the pull your punch. <laughs> and the pull your punch part, yeah. it's. Uh, I mean, definitely, that. those were some of the funnier parts of the film, and I thought they had a really natural chemistry as well, and I can't wait to see more of Jeffrey Wright, which we probably will with the Gotham PD show that's going to be coming out on HBO Max at some point. They're about to start production, but we'll see what happens there. Uh, moving on, Colin Farrell as Oswald Cobblepot, the Penguin. I'm still struggling to believe that. I yeah. sat there and stared at him every time he was on screen, like stared, like didn't look at anything else on the screen. I was like, that's not him. There's no way. I know. Like, <laughs> and I'm sitting there and like at one point I looked over at you and I said, he actually looks more like uh, Robert De Niro with like light makeup and, and, you know, scar and all that stuff made up. It doesn't look like Colin Farrell. There was like a couple of times where he'd give a certain look. That I saw a hint of Colin Farrell in there, but otherwise he completely disappears. I mean, yeah, he, he could be like a spy and like go disappear somewhere, and I wouldn't know it was him. 
And the makeup itself was phenomenal, but yeah, he's gone underneath it. Like, everything that makes him, like, the recognizable guy that I know is is banished. <laughs> and he is absolutely fantastic in this role. He is. He didn't sound like himself either. He's, he sounded a little like Danny DeVito at certain times, actually. And, there, and that's another character that's going to have his own spinoff show on HBO Max. And I am all here for it. Kind of seeing maybe his rise through Gotham's Underworld. Man, he was he was great. Uh, moving on, Andy Serkis as Alfred. Again, uh, if you're a fan of Earth One, you're going to be a really big fan of his portrayal. Uh, he does that to a T and does it very well. I will say, I mean, come on, he's one of the great actors going today. I mean, but he it's can so just weird disappear. To actually, roles. get to see him. Yeah, you actually get to see him. You know, he's not Caesar from Planet of the Apes or Gollum or anything like that. Yeah, he's he's just getting to be him himself. So that's fantastic. Uh, one thing I will say is, I'm so used to Bruce and Alfred in multiple all iterations really in live action being partners and having a really close relationship i will say that is not the case here i would the i think the thing i described it as was their relationship throughout most of the movie is cold like it's kind of like they're partners and they're on the same team but there's not very much communication going on no and i get the sense with based on the events that happen in the movie that that will probably change going forward yeah that there'll be some more closeness but um, there was kind of there was kind of a big barrier they had to break through there. Yeah. Um, with some secrets that had been kept, you know, all the things that Chris was talking about earlier with um, his family's history and everything. Um, and Alfred knew some of that and knew how some of that tied together and had never told him. And so I think now that that's out in the open, I'm hoping that that'll sort of mend that a bit. But it, it, the good thing is in that you know he didn't tell Bruce the things he knew because he didn't have the in game answer. And so he's like, I wanted to get the answer before I told you. And he, he never was able to. And uh, that's another thing, too. Like, really, the murder of the Waynes is left very... You don't know whether it was actually, truthfully, whether it was, like, uh, uh, Maroney that did it, uh, Falcone that did it, or if it was just a random mugging. They leave that very vague, and it would not surprise me a bit if they don't address that in the future at some point and really put more of a definite point on it. But it is something to think about. Um, but, and that of course, Paul Dano. <sighs> okay. You, back in 2008, when the joke, when the dark Knight came out, everybody dressed as this Joker for Halloween, myself included. Uh, I have a feeling this Halloween people are going to be dressing up as the Riddler. Cause mm -hmm. it's a fairly easy costume to make mm -hmm. and it's just perfect. Uh, he is, just transcendent in the role absolutely phenomenal every bit as iconic i think as the, as heath ledger was as the joker and he at times he was terrifying oh yeah he's very very much that unhinged thing going on but very purposeful like whereas the joker's all about the chaos he had a purpose yeah like his was very you know intricately planned for a reason absolutely uh but i mean I want to see more of him. I think that, that they've left it where he could potentially come back, and I would love to see if that happens. But, I mean, dude, if, if Paul Dano is just owning it right now. He's one of the great actors in Hollywood, and he proves it even more so in this movie. And uh, last actor I've got here is John Turturro as Carmine Falcone. And I'm going to tell you something. I love uh, John Turturro in multiple movies, especially Oh Brother, Where Art Thou? And uh, Mr. Deeds was another personal favorite of mine. Uh, do not seek the treasure, but <laughs> he is an SOB in this one. Oh yeah, for sure. I mean, you just, you just want to choke him. I mean, he, and he's a cocky little arrogant smug. I mean, he's a mob boss that can't be touched. He's owning Gotham. I mean, of course he'll be that, but he does such a wonderful job in this role. He does. And I had forgotten who it was. And so I asked him after the movie, I was like, who was that? Who did I know his face? Who is that? And then he did the, do not seek the treasure. And then I was like, oh. oh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But I mean, th this cast just knocked it out of the park. And the fact that they did what they did when like 75% of the movie was done under COVID protocols. And actually I was reading an article today where Matt Reeves, because he was so concerned about catching COVID during that time and knew that like, if he went down, the whole thing was going to go down that he like was wearing everything from like 
you know, scuba goggles to like, he was like completely covered head to toe, like in just trying to like create a barrier to protect himself. And he would like not really talk to the actors, but the fact that he, that they gave the performances under some of these conditions is even more impressive. I think that they pulled this movie off. So let's, let's move on a bit and just talk about, you know, some other things in the movie that are really, that I thought was really cool. Let's talk about Gotham. We've seen like the really gothic stuff in in Burton's Batman. We've seen the really neon kind of garish stuff in the Schumacher films. We've seen like more Batman or Gotham as a real city in the Dark Knight trilogy. You know, we've seen all that stuff. But here, it feels very real world. It feels very lived in. But it also has this kind of. I've seen some people talk about like the Arkham games, which I'm not a video gamer, so I'm not really that aware of that part of it. But it does feel very realistic. It does feel like an actual place you can visit. It does. I mean, even down to like, there's kind of a constant like haze and grungy look about it. Like mm-hmm. it's, you know, kind of smoggy and ick and um, it's always dreary. I don't think there's a, like a really good sunny shot in that whole movie. Yeah. It feels like it rained like 80% of the movie. Mm-hmm. And uh, I think the word I used last night when we were talking on the drive home was claustrophobic. I mean, you just feel, it feels like a weight on top of you just watching the movie. This, this city does. And yeah, you know, if it rained all the time and it was that grimy and gross and everything, I don't. I'm not surprised it's a crime cesspool. I mean, mm-hmm. it, it's absolutely in that vein. It feels like this movie and Seven could coexist together. It would be like the same city because I think in Seven it doesn't really say what city it is. It wouldn't surprise me a bit if it was Gotham. Actually, I mean it. It seems like the right kind of killer for that. Yeah, exactly. So, uh, but also let's move on to Batman is really legitimately the focus Mm -hmm. of this movie. He is. And even when it's done at its best, the Dark Knight trilogy and everything, it does feel a little bit like, okay, Batman and here's the new villain. And there's a lot of story about the villain. And sometimes Batman gets the short shaft. Batman is literally in 80% of the movie. Or Bruce Wayne. Or Bruce Wayne being, you know, like undercover, you know, doing detective work. This is very much Batman is at the center. Everything's revolving around his reactions, his thoughts, his feelings towards everything. And that is such a nice change of pace from the other movies. Yeah, because we, you do, you get kind of caught up in like what's going on with the villains and getting the villains headspace. And I feel like 90% of the time when we're, we're seeing riddler as our villain in this it's when he's somehow like being watched by batman like because he's you know cast something on the tv or he's on the phone or he's doing you know something like that and so it's not like we're um like completely getting away from batman to go see the riddler it's like we're seeing the riddler through batman's perspective yeah exactly and it was just really nice and which kind of goes into kind of the next thought that i had which was it is a fantastic mystery noir detective movie. It's the world's greatest detective actually doing a story. And we don't know what's going on. We're figuring it out as he is. And that was so fun because we like we love mystery stories. Mm-hmm. I mean, we love like Knives Out. We love, you know, the, the Poirot movies and everything. Uh, I mean, it was just nice to kind of be uncovering that and watching Batman actually do the detective work. Yeah, and it was also nice for us to not know more than he did. Yeah. Um, we were kind of that, like, I guess, you know, sort of almost limited, non- omniscient type, you know, viewpoint where we saw everything that Bruce saw, and if he didn't see it, we didn't see it for the mm-hmm. most part, um, you know, with a couple of exceptions. But, yeah, that does make it really cool, and I liked this mystery because it was so grounded, like, this felt like like an actual case you could see. Now, in the midst of this case, though, it gets very, um, like, torture-ish, actually. Yeah. Now, because it's PG-13, they kind of have to pull back a little bit and not show you everything, but you're certainly getting the very uncomfortable sense of what is happening or has happened. It's like you get the feeling that this would be an R-rated movie if, like, they just showed a little bit more. Mm-hmm. And they that they just pull back like literally to the precipice of being an R rated movie. It's as it's as R rated as a PG thirteen movie can be. Honestly, yeah. it's right on the edge there. But I mean, that also brings up another point that we've talked about. You know, you're talking about like, the realism and everything there about you know 
all the characters here not feeling cartoonish, I guess, for lack of a better word. Yeah, one thing, um, you know, we, we have a lot of comic book movies these days. Yeah. And for the most part, most of them look like comic books. Um, they've all got like the, the bright colors and the patterns and the very, um, you know, very costumey looks. And I feel like with this movie, particularly when you look at villains, even in The Dark Knight, the villains get kind of costumey. Yeah, the Joker's got um, the purple coat. Mm. The Scarecrow's got the weird, like, mask. Like, who would have that? I mean, honestly. Like, <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, in, in Bane, you know, he's got his whole thing, which, I mean, did serve a technical purpose, but still, I mean, it was it's definitely a costumey look. Um, but in this, the, the Riddler even has something that, I mean, he's something you could go pick up somewhere. Like it's, it's something that was ready made that he just picked up because it was, it was easy and easily re to replicate, easy to replicate. Um, and so that was, it was cool to feel like everything was real. Like, you know, someone walking down the street outside could have done the exact same thing rather than some like crazy green leotard with question marks all over it. Um, so I liked that about it. And I even like he was saying earlier with, Batman's ensemble, I mean, his stuff all served a purpose. So. I feel like up and I feel like this was the first time I watched a live action movie even with Nolan trying, you know, the hyper realism and everything that he tried to, to accomplish, which I think largely he did. It literally felt like for the first time that Batman could exist in the real world. Like, it was approaching that, like, that didn't seem so far-fetched as it seemed before this movie. Um, now, obviously, it's still far-fetched, but, like, the fact that they got that, that they did this movie to the point where you could just about have that feeling, I think that was quite an accomplishment. And I, the other thing I think, um, we, you know, in the past we see a lot of Batman kicking butt, and sometimes it seems like that's all he's doing. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, how much butt can you get kicked before you just stop? Um, <laughs> yeah. But then in this... I mean, as much as he was, as much as he was in that Batman outfit, I would say half the time he was fighting and half the time he was just talking to somebody, um, or investigating or whatever. Mm -hmm. And so it was, um, that felt more real too. Like, you know, someone didn't quite have to push their limits quite so far. <laughs> Which I mean, that does kind of go right into another thing I was thinking a lot about was, was just the action in this movie. You know, we would, you know, by what we've said so far, if you haven't seen the movie yet, you would think like, okay, this is just like very much a mystery not very much action, no. There is a lot of action. I mean, there's a lot of fight scenes with Batman. I love that they don't do a whole lot of cutting on this. Like, it's all very straight on, and you get to see a lot of the fight choreography, and it is awesome. Uh, this is a very brutal Batman, obviously. I'm thinking about, you know, the thug fight at the very beginning of the movie. Um, I'm thinking about, like, the car chase with Oswald. Ooh, yeah. And, you know... There's no CGI there, apparently, according to Matt Reeves and in interviews he's given. That was 100% everything. The car going through the flames, all of it, real. Which is great. Uh, but, I mean, that I think that is the centerpiece of the film, if there is a centerpiece. It's that car chase. It's so awesome. And then also just, like, that ending fight at Gotham Square Garden with all the other Riddlers... Uh, you know, trying to take out everybody from the rafters and, you know, the way he drops in and just starts, you know, going through and it's not really like cutting back different camera angles. It's like one continuous shot there for a while where he's just working his way through the action. in this is superb and really almost brutal at parts. It is, but it feels, I mean, again, it feels like something someone would really do yeah. rather than being like all, you know, super trained by Ra's al Ghul and co. It's like, it feels like somebody who's just angry. He's a brawler. Yeah. Which I mean, you know, you talk about him being angry. Again, we're we're I mean, we're just seeing right into I think one of the best points here, which is with this movie, of course, there's the very famous thing, and I mean we did it at you know, we'll have a clip of it that I'll that I've already planned to put at the very beginning of this video where, you know, it's the I'm vengeance line. Mm -hmm. And um it's very interesting in that that part was for the trailers and all the brutality and everything, but really it's great to see Batman transition and he recognizes that you know, at, the, at the start of the movie, he thinks he's having no effect. So he's just doing whatever he's just taking out his anger. Um, but by the end of it, especially one of the Riddlers, you know, they take off his mask and says, who, who are you? 
And he goes, I'm vengeance. And he throws that right back in his face. And he realizes, oh, I have had In fact, it's not the one I want. And so he's understanding that he needs to move from vengeance to hope. And he literally says that towards the end of the film. I need to go from vengeance to hope. And it's really cool to watch that transition happen. Uh, this is very much a Batman that's still figuring it out as he goes. And that's important to recognize as you're going. He's not fully formed. He's a brawler. And he's understanding now that he needs to work in a different way. Now, there, the no-kill rule is still is very much in effect from the beginning. But everything else, it's very much in flux. And I think also in the next Batman movie, you're going to see Bruce Wayne step up to the plate more. Especially if he keeps the Earth-1 influence in the second book or the second volume of Earth One, Bruce recognizes I need Bruce Wayne is needed just as much as Batman is. So uh, that's that's really uh, uh, that's really a cool part. So uh, the last thing before we kind of get into kind of the the bigger broader thing on the picture uh, is just the fact, and I guess we'll get into that too is. I love how they, and I think comic book films and comic books are at their best whenever they start to bring in things that are going on in the world in a very natural kind of way. It reflects the time we live in, so to speak. And I feel like they did a very good job with that. I mean, there's definitely a through line, which I think is very much the case right now, good or bad, uh, of distrust in institutions. That's very much prevalent in this. Uh, that's the whole point of R the Riddler's Crusade. It is. Uh, but then there's also, you know, about marginalized people and you know, them kind of banding together on social media. Mm -hmm. um, that is also something that's heavily at play. There are definitely a few things where I was like, okay, that hits a little strongly for the stuff that's going on in today's world. Yeah, it definitely does feel timely in that way. Yeah, exactly. So um, it kind of comes back to, so what... Overall, were your thoughts kind of in, we're kind of wrapping this up. What are your kind of concluding thoughts about where you stand with this movie? So much to my surprise, um, we left this movie and I shocked him by saying, I think this might be my new favorite. Um, I just appreciate the realness of this one. I appreciate um, the style and the acting and the, the just casting choices in general. Um, it was something that made me really look forward to a next one. It's it. Sometimes I feel like with, with comic book movies and with Batman movies in the past, um, I felt like I had to see them a couple times before I really like got attached to them. Mm -hmm. And this one, I just felt like as soon as I watched it, I was like, this is so good. I want to go see it again immediately. <laughs> yeah. And so for, and I feel the same way. I told you, I said, I'm not sure where I put this one. Um, my expectation was it had the potential to be, one that we talked about with, you know, The Dark Knight, Batman 1989. Uh, I do feel that way. Uh, I feel like it's in that conversation. It's not on the lower end. It's definitely towards the top. Uh, I don't know how I would rank it in relation to specifically The Dark Knight and uh, Batman 1989. But here's one thing I can tell you. Two things, actually. The first one is the last time... I had this feeling of almost confusion towards what I was, how I felt about something, knowing that it was amazing, but just couldn't quite process it yet, was walking out of the dark night the first time I watched it. It was like, I don't know what I just saw, but I just saw something amazing. That's all I know. That's the same thing with this movie. I definitely will need some rewatches to really process where it hits on that for me. Uh, but also, it just kind of comes back to this point You've seen with Batman historically, now granted I wasn't alive for some of these, but there have been moments where Batman has hit the pop culture, I guess what, you know, has just hit that perfectly and become just an absolute raving success and really just hit a point that went beyond just being a popular movie like three other times in history. Now there was the Batman 1966 TV series which did that. The 1989 film absolutely did that, and it is the modern-day superhero blockbuster and really paved the way for Spider-Man, X-Men, and then everything else that came after the you know the early 2000s. And then The Dark Knight in 2008. It just took over. Uh, as far as... 
And I think that when Batman movies do that, it's because they just, it's the right movie for the right time. It's hitting on the right kind of things that are going on during that time while also being timeless at the same time. Like you look at Batman 1989 now, it still works. But you can also tell it was of the 80s. But it still works today. It's the same thing with The Dark Knight. This movie is doing that now. I firmly believe that. And I think it, we're going to look back on it very much similarly in that way. And I cannot wait to flesh out this world more. I think it's going to be absolutely amazing. Bring on Gotham PD. <laughs> Bring on uh, Oswald Cobblepot's show. Bring on... I would love to see a cat. I think Catwoman... Because at the end of the movie, she's leaving Gotham. Let's go see what she's getting into somewhere else, right? Yeah. yeah I think she was heading to Bloodhaven is what she told them. Bloodhaven, yeah. Like, of course, we know who's going to later inhabit that. Let's bring Robin in. I mean, that that would be cool. So uh, so any final words before we uh, get out of here, Michelle? We've talked a lot, but I knew this would be a long video because not because we meandered. Actually, I think we I left a lot of stuff off. But, you know, it's just there's a lot to talk about here. But any final thoughts? I think it's amazing, but you got to go see for yourself, so go and watch it if you haven't, um, and definitely let us know what you thought. Absolutely, yeah. And so that, yeah, let us know in the comments uh, what you thought, if you've seen the Batman, what you thought, and uh, also, if you like what we're doing here at D's Nerds, and we're just two nerds on one channel talking about the things we love and why we love them, please subscribe to the channel. Also, click that bell icon so you know whenever we have new videos coming out. We're also on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter. So if you miss us in between videos, you can follow us there. Also, we have merch. So if you'll just go down to that link down in the description that takes you to our store, anything you buy there just supports the channel, and we greatly appreciate that. So, guys, until next time, I'm Chris. I'm Michelle. And we are D's Nerds. You guys have a great, safe rest of the day. Bye. Bye.